Susan, you and I have known each other for a very long time, and uh, I have always thought of you as a sister mentor, but to have you found National Cares Mentoring and actually be a sister mentor for so many people, how did you come to found National Cares Mentoring? Well, today I'm a mother mentor to you and many others. I don't even try it. A sister mother, a mother sister. You know, New Orleans is the home of the Essence Music Festival, as you know, now the Essence Fest. And Katrina devastated the city and swept away so many of the lives of the people who helped us to produce the festival. And when we realized how vulnerable the children were, and we were planning the next festival, which had to take place in Houston, I said, we have to do more than have a party with a purpose, because it always had a purpose. Yes, indeed. But we have to deepen the purpose. And why don't we just ask, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who gather to go back to their respective cities and to mentor the vulnerable children? And I thought that the request over three days at the empowerment seminars would be enough. It proved not to be. And so we launched Essence Cares. And it was a call to action to do just what I stated. And when I wrote about it in the magazine and people just responded, we're losing our, our children. We're lo I'm afraid for my children. I'm particularly afraid for my son or my sons. And you're a mother and you know, you're a mother now. So you know that fear. Yes. And I said, okay, uh, we need you now. So we replicated. What we did was we were founded actually in Houston at the festival, and then it replicated to Atlanta. And from there, all across the country, we're in 58 US cities today. That is absolutely amazing. And I know the impact that a mentor can have on a young person's life. Um, my first mentor outside of my family was my third grade teacher. Uh, Mrs. Melba Azell, and um, even though I am looking at 60 around the corner, she probably had the biggest impact on me as a young person because she made me dream of future places that I had only read about in books. Mm -hmm. And as a mentor teacher, she told me there were possibilities. What drives your passion for National Care as Mentoring? I never thought I'd be doing this star. You know, my I grew up in Essence. I'm 75. And I I, I went to Essence at 24 yes. as the beauty editor, then fashion and beauty editor, then editor in chief of the magazine. I stayed for 37 years. And I thought that I'd be living in Florida, working at one of the HBCUs, teaching magazine making or journalism. It's the crisis in the community, it's the crisis of poverty. It's the blaming and shaming and demonization of poor black people that made me step into this arena. The fact that our children, innocent, feel demonized and, and blamed and they're surveilled. And I just said, I, I'm a bridge. I'm be, a bridge between people like you and the community that all of us emerged from. If not your generation, then your parents or maybe their parents. But growing up in Harlem, not one person who I grew up with in that building survived. Not one who didn't move uh -huh. because their parents, they came out of two parents, two parent households and had the resources to move. We moved to Queens and it changed my life. And as you, I, I'm just thinking about the fact that you did arrive at Essence in your 20s. As you said, at 24, you founded actually your own cosmetics company to start out and then went on to be beauty editor at Essence Magazine, the publication that you would shape into a world-renowned brand, literally with more than 8 million readers. And of course, I, as a young black woman, was a subscriber forever. I got my sense of self. Um, in, the, in the process, no doubt, you changing generations of brown girls' lives and perceptions of self. Tell me how those experiences prepared you for where you are now in your career. You know, I, I'd say I grew up in my father's women's clothing store in Harlem. And that taught me how to present myself because I had to welcome the people and I started selling, selling stockings and then counting pennies. And, you know, going to Essence, when I was interviewed by the then editor-in-chief, Ida Lewis, 
I didn't need the job. I had my own cosmetics company. I was married at the time, not to my Kefra, but to my former husband. And I just walked in there feeling confident, more confident at 24. I think I was 23 when I went and 24 when they hired me than I am these some days at, at 75, you know? And I believed in me and therefore Ida Lewis believed in me. And I said, if you give me an opportunity, I will deliver the very best beauty pages you could possibly have. And so I think, you know, we're talking about the height of the black power movement and black women who were journalism majors and were working as journalists, few, few were working as journalists. They weren't interested in anything as mundane as beauty. And that's how I got my foot in the door. And you told us that beauty came in all hues. And Susan, I'm not sure if you understand this. We believed you. We actually believed you. So that gave us a sense of self. And we often hear people say, you really want to see yourself in order to believe that you can be that person. And so you gave us living examples of ourselves on a regular, everyday, monthly basis. And I have to tell you, as one of those young black women, my sense of self was really formed and shaped through the experiences of those women in Essence magazine. So from a grateful brown girl, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. I loved, I loved my job as fashion and beauty editor. I loved it. I mean, I loved being editor in chief for all of those years, but I really loved fashion and beauty because at the time star, the modeling agencies didn't have the breadth of black beauty. Mm. They didn't have that expression of, you know, women who was white as snow with blue eyes, but who were black and women who was black as, you know, coal and, who, and also as beautiful as everybody in the middle. And it, I was determined, determined that I would find the most exquisite representations of every manifestation of black women's beauty. And I would get off of trains and, off buses, go across the, the room at restaurants if I saw a woman whose beauty I thought should be, you know, amplified in essence. And I loved that, you know, different body shapes. Nobody at, essence, at the modeling agencies was anything more than you had to be a size seven. That went down to about a size zero and then three, you know, and it was just a joy taking the women from Broadway. Uh, some of the colored girls who were in the play for colored girls, yes. and putting them on the covers as models. And it was just a joy to be able to really redefine what it really means to be a beautiful human being from the inside out. That's the way that I approach beauty, really writing about it and speaking about it as an inner value that is reflected outwardly. And the fact that each of us is a divine original. We only see these prototypes of what we think is beautiful. And it's really torturous to women, torturous. And you know, it's so interesting that you've taken this, this experience and love of beauty and fashion and really formed it into a way to inspire others to find all the beauty in themselves, the beauty, the brains, the heart, the soul. So that makes me ask you, what are your core values? I hear you say the word values a lot. So what are your core values? What I have come to value more than anything is spiritual wisdom. I think with wisdom, you have understanding. And with understanding, you don't make war. With understanding, you're not blaming the husband who was violent. You're not blaming the person who derailed your life in the third grade, the teacher who disrespected you. You know, the person who hurt your feelings when she or he slammed down a cup of coffee and it spilled on your dress. You, you, there's something that I wrote many, many years ago because I, I felt that my family, I knew my family, my parents loved me, but I didn't think they liked me. They were some stern Caribbean people. And they were older parents when they became parents. My mother was in her late thirties. That was older then. And my father was almost 50 when I was born. And, you know, I started researching their lives. Let me find out what mommy's experience was in Trinidad and daddy's in St. Kitts and my grandmother's in Barbados. And what I came to is this, I've heard it repeatedly. I think I may have been the first one to really write it and really unpack it. But I said, ah, they were hurt and hurt people hurt people. Yes, because indeed. Pain with us wherever we go. So we don't take anybody's bad behavior personally. 
If you can't help them, step away. That I actually heard that for the first time um, from you. So mm -hmm. I can tell you that it's been my experience that I've quoted you numerous times over the years. Hurt people do indeed hurt people, which makes me ask, how do you, who has had tremendous success and has been in the spirit for a very long time. How do you deal with setbacks and disappointments? You know, I try to fall forward because you know, you can't live and not fall. You, I try to stay in the flow. Mm -hmm. And to me, Star, the most important question that we all must ask when things seem to be falling apart, who hasn't that happened to? Yes. It happened to every president who sat in that White House, including um, Donald Trump. You know, Barack Obama, look what happened to him. I mean, how they demonized him and, and, and blamed him for things that just seemed that were inconsequential. What I do is I ask this question, and it's a question that I learned from the what was he, 14th century Sufi mystic. Oh. What have you come to teach me, Rumi? What have you come to teach me? Pain is information, that's all it is. It's information, it's never, we've made up this, this punishing God who wants to be praised and who wants to be bowed down to. Each of us is human and divine and we can live in the sanctuary, the temple, the mosque and never come to know our divinity. It is imbued, embedded in us. And when we pause and ask the question, what has this setback, this pain, this disruption, this shame come to teach me? There's a lesson to be learned. And when we learn that lesson, we're able to, ah. And well, you know, we look back on our pain. Can you look back on any pain and say, ooh, you know, that was the most horrific thing. I wish it never happened. I mean, maybe there's some things we can look at like that. Yes, mm, but I, I've always had the attitude, let's try to figure out how to turn this set back into the setup for the next success. Yes. That's always been my mantra. And as I think about you as the recipient of more than a dozen honorary doctorates, hundreds of awards, even ones that I've had the privilege of giving to you, but including the Phoenix Award, which is the highest honor given by the Congressional Black Caucus, what motivates Susan Taylor to succeed? The crisis in our community, yes. We just can't stop. Yes. And we are able, we are stable, we are privileged. You know, today's African-Americans who are middle class are the most privileged black people on the planet. And when we think about what our parents and grands and great grands and our ancestors did with little or nothing and how distant so many of us are from poor black people. Very often what we'll do, we give to our families. We absolutely do. And we give to our, our faith communities. But to our struggling young, there's a real disconnection. We don't live in the communities that we grew up in. Most of us don't anymore. People of my age don't at least. You know, so what motivates me is knowing that I can be a bridge, a sturdy bridge. We can build sturdy bridges to the pathways that lead people out of poverty, intergenerational poverty towards sustainability. You know, Susan, it's very interesting. My husband and I have that very much in common. We grew up in public housing, uh, me in Trenton, New Jersey at the Miller Homes, he in Chicago at the notorious Cabrini Green Homes. And um, his, his whole family went to Cooley High. So he grew up in an environment where they told him he was not going to succeed. Um, but interestingly enough, he and several friends that we know who grew up in that same environment that has the same lived experience that we have, have tried to turn that experience into that bridge that you were so eloquently speaking about so that people can continue to see themselves in successful people and people who have setbacks who sometimes fall, but as you would say, try to fall forward also. So I'm thinking about mentoring and I'm asking you, the sister mentor, who has been your guiding light? Who are the women and the men that you've looked to um, for examples? It's so interesting. I grew up in a family of just some empowered, big buxom Caribbean women who just own their power. 
you know, and you, I dare not speak mine, <laughs> you know, but you listened and you, you watched. And they were my first mentors, my parents, my father, such a hardworking man who opened, he unwound his, what do you call it, the awning every morning yeah. at two o'clock, you know, on 116th Street in Harlem. And um, they were my first mentors. And then stepping into Essence, I hadn't even gone to college when I joined Essence. And I, I was, can I really write something? I used to write the little things. I thought I was going to be an actor, but I wasn't good. But I wrote my <laughs> part and I got these parts. When I stepped in there, they helped me to write my copy, my beauty copy, my fashion copy. And Marsha Ann Gillespie, who then became my boss when she became editor in chief, she said, huh, if you can speak, you can write. You know, so I've been mentored all along. Maya Angelou, you know, such a good friend. I'm laying on her pillow right behind me. <laughs> you know, she just loved me and checked in on me more than I checked in on her. So I'm mentored to Daystar by the young people in my organization, the Julias and Deborahs and, you know, technology. They helped me with all of that. And so I just think all around us, we have people who can lead and teach. And what we have to do is really sometimes just be quiet mm -hmm. and allow and, and not be ashamed of what we don't know. I find that we learn the most from those who are older than we are and those who are younger than we are. And um, instead of just sort of hanging with your contemporaries, just sit sometimes with the elders and listen, as you would say, be still and listen. You walk away with a great amount of knowledge when you do that, absolutely. So as a, a lifelong activist who clearly has worked to ensure the rights and freedoms and opportunity for people of color around the globe, your work in South Africa is legendary. What does it mean to you to be named a catalyst for change in one of Marquis Who's Who's first oh. makers lists? Oh, Star, I wanna live up to it. You know, I wanna live up to it. I, I, I am honored to have been named, you know, I, I really am. And I, I don't want to disappoint. Having people watch you keeps you on the straight and narrow. I'm afraid of who I would be if nobody was looking, you know? I mean, in those early years, especially when, you know, we could all have been wild and crazy. But I think this is really an honor to stand on the same ground with the other women who are being so named and to know that we can be way showers for the younger women coming behind us. Uh, we want them to stand on our shoulders. We want them to rely on us. We want to mentor them. We want them to, without shame, bring their pain, bring their questions, bring any confusions to us. We may be able to help. We all need somebody we can lean on. So I really thank you. Thank you for this honor. Thank you for thinking of me and thank you for inviting me. You've actually said that securing our vulnerable children is your highest calling. When I read that, it, it, it made me take a breath in because I realized the weight on the shoulders of us for our children. Um, and you've also called it the big business of our nation in black America today. How do you plan to continue to be that catalyst for change as it relates to our children. What I'm working on is helping to create America the Beautiful. Mm. We have to make it so. We sing it, people say it, but we're not living it. And so I'm doing my part, my part in leading, being a gentle leader, being firm, sure, secure, gentle, knowing that I'm not always right, and also knowing my proper place. I don't want to, I didn't plan on being 75 doing this work. And I certainly don't want to be 80 in this particular space. I want to always be available to raise money. And the programmatic work is, I'm a content creator, not a nonprofit expert. And that's where I live in the programs that we have around the country. You know, I have to tell you, they are changing young people's lives because we've given them a safe place to, share their pain, because I speak honestly and openly about my own. Some of the things that people would never believe that I would say, because young people say, oh, you adults, you all are you all just telling us what we should be and how we need to stay on the, on the straight and narrow, but you never talk about the mess ups and mistakes you made. Well, I do, you know, so how do I plan? I just plan to keep being the best me that I can bring to life every day. 
knowing that I don't always get it right, to own it when I don't, and to celebrate it when I do. And we celebrate you because uh, you are the living, breathing example of what a catalyst for change not only does, but can do in the lives of others. So thank you very much. Thank you for being the glue that really keeps us together. <laughs>